Welcome to Nomad PHP Lightning Talks. I'm Joe Ferguson. Nomad PHP Lightning Talks are 10 minute talks that give a high level overview or an in depth look at a small portion of a PHP related topic. Lightning Talks are a great way for new speakers to build their speaking resume and for long time speakers to test drive new talk ideas. If you'd like to give a 10 minute Lightning Talk, please email me, joe at nomadphp.com. Right now we have David McKay and he's going to talk about diving deep into Docker. Please make sure you visit Joined In after the talk and leave David some feedback. David, take it away. All right, Joe, thank you for that, and thank you for having me. I am David McKay. I am a developer from Glasgow, Scotland, and this is Diving Deep with Docker. So I am a software consultant, and as well as that, I try and be very involved in my open source and developer communities. So I am the organizer of Docker Glasgow. And I am putting together, or part of the team that's putting together, the very first Scotland PHP conference, which will be this year in October in our wonderful capital, Edinburgh. So this is a very vague title. I said we're going to dive deep into Docker, but I'm also doing a 10-minute lightning talk, right? So that's not exactly off to the best start. But what I want to do is dive into one of the areas that I find most people kind of trip up on when they're adopting Docker or bringing it into their continuous integration workflow, or bringing it into their development environment, or even worse, their production. And that is something called layering. So what is a layer? Well, in the simplest form, the layer is just a collection of files, which are the product of some sort of command that you run within a Docker container or within the Docker file. There are I would say just under a dozen different keywords that you can use within your Docker file, and each of these are going to perform different attributes towards the Docker image that you're building. So most of these keywords are going to produce no operations, but there are some very important ones that involve mostly getting your code or provisioning the system that you're putting together to provide a container. And this is where you're going to expand most of your space. This is where your image is going to start to grow in size. So let's just take a quick look at an example Docker file, and you'll see that I've highlighted the, the, the Docker keywords in red. So we start with the from, which is our base layer. This is where you are deciding if you want to run CentOS, Ubuntu, or any other distribution of your choice. For the examples in this talk, we're going to use Alpine, which is kind of like BusyBox, but with really good package management. You'll find that a lot of the official Docker images are actually moving towards using this because it's under 5 meg in size, which is a great starting point for building your, your application containers. After that, we have a run command. You're going to have to do some sort of provisioning on your Docker container, so you're going to have to get other applications or the environment that you require to run your software. Next, we have a copy. That could be an add, and this is just a way of a getting some of your local files, probably your source code, or your binaries into the Docker container itself. In this example, I'm assuming I want to send the entire current directory, which is quite common in a PHP application, and we want to make it available at slash bar www. So the next two keywords are perfect examples of what we call a, a no-op, and that is our working directory. So we're saying that any command executed when we run this image will happen from within this directory. After that we have an entry point. The entry point is just saying when you run this image as a container, we're going to kind of hope that you always want to run this command. And they don't have any sort of file output, so they are no operations. They don't really cost us anything. What we're really going to focus on are run and copy. So let's have a, a quick look at what this is going to kind of be like as we do our Docker build. So we start with the first command, or from. This is our base image. This is layer one. So we have to start somewhere. After that, we were doing a little bit of provisioning by installing PHP onto our Alpine-based system. This creates layer two. It sits on top of layer one. And as we continue through, you see that layer three is our copy. And we have layer four, which is our working directory. The thing that we have to kind of worry about here is what are the size of my layers and what are these going to cost or attribute towards the size of my entire image. So there are certain ways that we can start to debug these layers and work out where exactly we're expending so much space because nobody wants to be the person that has a three point gig image that they're trying to ship at production time, right? So Docker provides a really good couple of commands for that. We're going to look at the first one, 
which is the Docker history command. And this is going to give you a really good look at every layer in your image and how much it just cost you. So assuming that we want to take a look at the history of our image and our version, so this could be my super application core on version 14, you're going to get a very small list with the layer ID as the first column. Not particularly important, you may want to do something with the layer, but it's in green, you know what to look for when you run this command. The middle column is the command that was in our Docker file that attributed to this layer. Now, the way that the Docker history representation works is that we start from the bottom, our base, and we work up. So you'll see that the add file is pretty much going to be every base layer that you use. You're not going to see how they composed it, it's just a layer that adds files to your system, and there's not really much you can do about that. So you'll see Alpine's pretty small, 4.79 meg, and we move up to our next command from our Docker file. Here we have the run command for provisioning the system. Uh, PHP may not be 176 meg, it is an arbitrary number, but this is just purely an example. So right away we've already got a red flag, that's quite a big layer. We'll continue through the rest, we have the working directory, which I said is in the walk, it's zero bytes. As many as them as you want, that's completely fine. After that we have the copy, that's 190 meg, that is our application source code, probably our vendor directory, and anything else that we need to get into the Docker image. Probably not a lot you can really do about that, but there are some very bad things that you can do after a copy, and we'll cover that in a moment. Finally, we have the entry point of PHP, it's a no-op, it's zero bytes, we're looking pretty good there. Now, the key thing to remember is that although Docker is working on a kind of commit and mailing copy on write awesome system, is that it isn't Git. And that leads a lot of new people, you generally taking their their first foray into getting some sort of image built to throw into their production servers into a couple of problems. And the problem is that Docker has no idea what you've changed when you go through one of these run or copy commands. It only knows that something has changed on the disk, what file it is, and a new layer has to be created to represent that new change in state. So the problem here is that if you if you do a copy, and like most PHP applications, the chances are we're not running our web server as a root user, but we need to change the ownerships of all those files. We need to get them over to www data or nobody or somebody else. And Docker isn't aware that when you run that and you're changing that bit permission on every file exactly what's happening, and you end up with this, this terrible situation where you have a duplicate layer. Now in this example, it's only 190 meg, you know, that could be much worse. We're talking about an image that's maybe 600 meg. I have seen companies and people do this where their application or copy command is a gig, a gig and a half, or something's bigger, and they're immediately duplicating that, and it's not really getting them any value. So what do you do after that? What do you do when you go, right, okay, I know that I have all these layers, I know how big my image is, but I really want to take the next steps to get in this smaller. I want to improve this situation. And there's, there's a command that Docker provides, that I like to consider it Docker step debugging. And that's how we really get into the nitty gritty of our application, we start saying, not just that this is a layer, but what is this layer producing, and how can I start? So we're going to call this Docker step debugging, and we're going to go through a very a very trivial example, but enough to give you a bit more insight into what you're going to be doing in your own scenario. So we're going to go through the steps of the Docker file that we put together, and we're going to look at a different way of debugging this live, so you will. So we started the Docker file from a base image, Alpine 3.3, and we can actually replicate that on the command line by just doing a Docker run, and we're doing a dash dash rm, which just means delete me when I'm finished. And we're doing a dash it, which means that we want to interact with TTY. And we're running the image that we consider our base. Now this is going to get us into a prompt, a sh prompt, that allows us to start to execute arbitrary commands. Now of course our command is going to be that arbitrary. We're going to execute everything that is inside of our Docker file. So next up we had an apk update. Very basic, we just take away the run and we run that command in the container. Anytime you have a run in your Docker file, you're going to have to consider that a breakpoint. That's where we've made a change to the system 
We want to know what that change is. We want to know how much it costs us, and we want to know how we can fix it. And this is where Docker Diff comes in. So in another tab, another window, however you want to work, you run the Docker Diff, you put in the container name that was created, you need on the Docker Run, and you will get output like this. The, the key, I'm sure you could probably work out, but the C means that something's changed. We have, in fact, changed the slash root directory. And A means that we've added a file. So just by logging in, we're creating a HDL history file. You don't need to worry about that. But what we do notice is that we have changed the var and the var cache directory, and we've started to add some APK index files to them. Now, you may be thinking that's really simple. We're just going to add an extra run command, and we're going to rm that cache. It never has to exist, and immediately we'll save ourselves a couple of bytes. But unfortunately, there's a problem, and the best way to explain this problem, I like to think, is the Lego analogy. So let's assume that we're building a tower of Lego pieces. And we're going to assume that the very first piece is nailed into the ground, and we can no longer move it. But we want to build our tower anyway. So we start to put brick after brick after brick on top until we have a tower of six pieces large. If you want to change that second brick, you have to cascade and change every other brick. You have to take all the bricks off, and you have to rebuild the entire thing. So you've got to understand that when you put these layers together, that there's an impact on changing layers that are lower down in the tower. So we're going to continue with the step debugging and have a quick visualization of what this looks like. So we have our layer. We run, and we remove the cache. But if you'll notice there, even though we do the RM on layer 2, which uh, should be layer 3, you'll notice that we actually aren't removing layer 2. It's always going to exist no matter what. Once that layer is there, it's there forever. So there are a couple of ways that we can get around this. And the most simple one is that we start to chain the commands within our Docker file. So before we give Docker a chance to commit that layer, we say apk update, and we do a couple of ampersands, and we are in the cache before the run command finishes. Right away, we'll save the best space. The best way to debug that is to do a Docker commit on our other terminal. We save it as debugging one, and we have a new image with the command that we just ran, and we can then wash, rinse, and repeat. We can run that container or that image as a new container, and then start to tackle the next command in our Docker file. And you do that all the way through. And you make sure that anything that you don't need in your image, you're cleaning up as soon as possible. And hopefully, by the end of that, you're now down to a very small, super deployable, and quick image. Thank you very much for your time. If you would like to find out some more information about optimizing your Docker images, there is an article that I wrote on DataWire called How Not to Be the Engineer Running the 3 and a half Gig Image. And of course, all talks so feedback is definitely appreciated. And you can visit the link below. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us for another Nomad PHP Lightning Talk. If you'd like to give a Lightning Talk, please email me, joe at nomadphp.com. Please make sure you visit JoinedIn and leave David some feedback.